Well, as you are getting settled, I want to um, I want to pray for us. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would come in power, declare to us the truth of the good news about Jesus, and may that truth set us free, and may we walk out of here free indeed. It's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Justification by faith alone. Uh, what is that all about? Well, to justify someone is simply to declare them to be in the right, uh, to be right with respect to a standard. And when we talk about justification by faith alone in Christianity, we're talking about uh, the idea that God justifies, declares us to be in the right, right with respect to his standard, that we are acceptable uh, to him on the basis of faith alone. See, what justification by faith tells us is that nothing that I am, nothing that I have, nothing that I have done could make me acceptable before God. And that every attempt to keep a standard that I think would make me acceptable before God is simply a delusion. That God actually finds one thing and one life and one person acceptable, and that is Jesus. See, Jesus didn't just keep the righteous requirements of the law. He surpassed them. Jesus, Jesus didn't simply do righteousness. He is righteousness. And when God looks at Jesus' life, he says, yes, that is what I accept. That is the one I accept. And when we believe in him, we get him, Jesus for us. And so when God looks at us, all that he has is all ours. And God looks at us and he says, yes, I accept you on the basis of Jesus, who he is and what he has done. Justification by faith alone. Now that seems like a head trip. It can seem, it can feel a bit like a head trip. I was recently reading um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. And he won an award for it back in 2000, well, this year I think, he won an award uh, for the book. But uh, he talks about the disillusion of growing up in the streets of Baltimore and going to the public schools there and having to learn things like French and geography. And he sat there and he said, you know, I'm having to learn French. And I'm sitting there thinking, why do I need to know French? I need to know how to get home without being killed. And yet I'm sitting here learning French when I'm never going to be able to use this. I'm never going to be able to, it's not going to help me in life. I need to know how to navigate the streets. And all this does is delude me or pacify me or get me to think that, that, uh, that this is some kind of escapist reality when the reality is what I have to walk out of this class and face and what I have to walk home to growing up in the streets of Baltimore. In other words, what he was saying is like school for him felt like a head trip. It was totally unrelated to reality. And for some of us, Christian doctrine, theology feels like that. But I want you to know that the doctrine of justification by faith alone, that it was not formulated in the academy but in the laboratory of pastoral consolation. That Luther, Martin Luther, and Philip Melanchthon, and that the people who, who, really, who really started unearthing this in Scripture, they did, it, uh, they did it primarily because of its payoff in people's lives. You see, this doctrine, more than any other doctrine in the whole world, has set people in the pew, ordinary people, free. There's nothing been, there's not, never been a doctrine that, that released people so much as what this did to Northern Europe. I was once talking to a, a friend. He's a very smart uh, fellow. He's, a, he's an elder at a church up in the Bay Area. Uh, he graduated from Harvard Law. And he told me one time that he really appreciates it when the pastor at the end of the sermon says something like this. 
Now, if you heard what I'm saying, then this is what it means for your life. In other words, come on, pastor, give me something concrete. Well, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to conclude this series by talking about six concrete things that justification by faith means for you in your life. Okay? So that's where we're going. Here's the first one. Justification by faith gives you a clean record. I want you to picture it with me. Um, there is a, there's a young teenage boy. He uh, gets caught up in the wrong crowd. As he's hanging out with this crowd, he ends up, um, he ends up in a gang. As part of this initiation to the gang, he is involved in Grand Theft Auto. These other fellows steal a car, and he's in the car with them. And he gets caught. It's on his record permanently. And that record haunts him through the rest of his life. Every time he tries to get a loan, every time he applies to a college, every time he tries to get a job, he always has to check the check mark, have you ever committed a felony? Yes. Please explain. And so time after time, he gets turned down. Why? Because people count his record against him. Here's the good news about justification by faith. God does not count our sins against us. Look back in chapter 4. Verses 5 through 8, Paul is explaining uh, the blessing of justification by faith. And he says, To the one who does not work, but believes in him, that is God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And then he goes on to say how David in the Psalms describes this. Verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and those whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sins. The Lord does not count your sins against you. That is what justification by faith means. Because Jesus paid for your sins. You see, see, we like to keep score, don't we? I'm always keeping score. Usually it's very easy to keep score in relationships, you know. Um, she had me as a bridesmaid in her wedding. Well, I guess I have to have her as a bridesmaid in my wedding? Or why didn't they invite us over when we invited them over? Or this is especially challenging in marriages. And it, and it crops up so easily. I, um, I had a birthday yesterday. I'm getting old. And Pam went out of her way to do all these wonderful things for me. It started with um, bacon-wrapped cinnamon rolls in the morning that rolled around the inside and, uh, and that went to, um, you know, smoked wings and, uh, and all the rest. And it was, it was like over the top. And I kept thinking to myself, um, she kept piling it on. And then I kept thinking, what did I do for her birthday? Did I forget her birthday this year? Did I do anything for her birthday? It was like, Urgh. the whole time I'm like keeping score. And it happens all the time. We keep score. What are they doing for me? What am I doing for them? Or am I getting this out of it? And there's this system and there's this scorekeeping and it kills relationships. But justification by faith says the score is settled. There's no need to score keep anymore. You see, we're all asking the question, how am I doing? Ever asked that question? Of course you have. How am I doing as a student? How am I doing as an employee? How am I doing as a pastor? How am I doing? We don't ask it usually directly, overtly. We have these subtle ways of asking it. How am I doing as a child, a parent, a sibling? How am I doing? And we want the answer, but we don't want the answer. Because we think we know what the answer might be. Deep down, we know that the answer is, how, to how am I doing? Am I doing enough? It's always not near enough to save you from damnation. That's the reality. You could never be enough or do enough, but here's the good news. Justification by faith. 
God does not count your sins against you. God does not count your record against you. Here's the good news of justification by faith. God looks at you just as if you had never sinned. And that's amazing. And that's just the first point. Second point. Justification by faith gives you peace. Chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You know, peace is something that we all want, but precious few, precious few of us have. Tranquility of mind. Uh, the ability not to be distracted or shaken by circumstances and adversity and all other things. Peace. It's why we're so obsessed with mindfulness today. Uh, because we know that we are not very mindful. We're always thinking about what's come before, and we're asking, how does that stack up against me? And we're also anxious about what's coming and saying, am I going to fulfill my duties and do enough and be enough? And so we're not present. Mindfulness. And it's, we're so obsessed with it now that like my daughter is getting taught mindfulness um, uh, techniques at school. But inner peace. That's what we want. The Bible calls it the peace of God. This steadiness in the midst of adversity. This calm in the midst of tragedy. And we all want the peace of God. But you know what? Paul offers us something better here. The peace of God is something that we want the most, but it's not what we need the most. What we need the most is what Paul offers here, and that is peace with God. Look at what he says in chapter 5, verse 1 again. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this isn't talking about an inner subjective feeling, but an external objective reality. Because our sin makes us enemies with God. Like it or not, that's the case. We are hostile towards God. Look at verse 10. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Or think of Habakkuk 1.13 that says that God's eyes are too pure to look upon evil. See, our sin puts us at odds with God. We are enemies with God. And yet, justification by faith, because God accepts us as righteous in Jesus, as having met the standard in Jesus, because we have Jesus, and God loves Jesus, and God accepts Jesus, and therefore he accepts us, well, that reconciles us, and we have peace. Uh, when I was in England, uh, it got really windy, and we were going to a wedding, and one day I opened the car door, and Pam opened her side of the car door, and the wind flew through the car, and, uh, and I didn't have a handle on it, and our little kind of clunker car door that wasn't worth much flew out and just smashed the uh, door of this Mercedes next to us. You know, as a grad student, that's always a good feeling. And so I said, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to write a note, and I'm going to write a really nice note, and the person's obviously going to um, show me mercy. I wrote this note, put it on the car door, and, uh, and they, they were very kind. This um, elderly British gentleman called. He was like, oh, people don't do this anymore. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, then, um, and then he sent me the bill. <laughs> it would have been amazing if he did not count my fault against me. It would have been amazing if he didn't absorb it. That would have been enough to go out to dinner. But you know what would have been even more amazing? If not only if he, he didn't charge me for his door, if he said, hey, and I have this big manor house and we would love for you to come stay. 
and I'm going to treat you to the weekend and throw a party for you. Now, that would have been even better if he would have entered into a relationship with me. You know, it is so glorious that God does not count our sins against us. And if that were all he did, that would be enough to sing and dance and party forever and ever and ever. But this says that we have more than that. It's not just that God doesn't count our sins against us. It's that God throws the party and invites us to it. We are reconciled to him. We have peace with God. We are no longer God's enemies. And here's what that means, Christian. God is not angry with you. God does not disdain you. God wants to be with you because he wants to be with his son and you have his son. God is for you. He loves you. And he wants relationship with you. Now that, peace with God, that's how you get the peace of God. That's how you get inner tranquility. That's how you get a steadfastness in the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of adversity. See, because what this does is it actually frees you to enjoy God. Look at verse 11. We also rejoice, boast, celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, before we are justified by faith alone, we are always wondering, am I enough? Have I done enough? Do I have enough? Am I going to be enough? It's like, um, it's like going to a dinner. And you get invited to this dinner. And at the end of the dinner, they're going to announce something. And what they're going to announce is going to determine your fate. Whether you can stay at the company or not, or whether you can uh, go to grad school or not, or whether you get into a college or not, or something like that. And so you get invited to this dinner, and it's an amazing dinner. The, um, the food is wonderful. The host is great. You're sitting around with friends. They're all telling jokes, and you enjoy none of it because you don't know what's going to be the outcome of this dinner. It does the host really like, is the host going to reject me? Is he going to say, no, you didn't get the award. You didn't get the scholarship. You didn't get this. You didn't get that. Actually, we have to do layoffs this year. And sorry, you're one of them. Thanks for the dinner. If we are justified based on who we are and what we do, what we have, we're always going to be in the presence of God wondering, does he really love me? Does he really accept me? Have I really done enough? Am I enough? And that means that you'll never fully be able to enjoy God's presence. But when you realize that you can't do enough, and you can't be enough, and you aren't enough, but Jesus, he is enough, and you have Jesus, and God accepts you as righteous on his account, well, then you can enjoy the meal. Then you can enjoy the jokes. Then you can enjoy the laughter. Then you can enjoy the host. Then you can enjoy God. And enjoying God, there's nothing better than that because there's nothing more praiseworthy than God. And praise, well, think about it. That is the culmination of enjoyment. Have you ever experienced something that was so amazing by yourself? And thought, I wish somebody were here with me to experience that. Do you know why? Because you need to talk about something. And praise something. And boast in something. For it. For your joy. And enjoyment of that thing. To come to culmination. God is the most praiseworthy thing. He is the truth. He is the beautiful He is the good. (laughs) And we were made to enjoy, to delight in him. And justification by faith allows us to do that. It frees us to enjoy God. And it also frees us to enjoy others. Because we don't have to be always worried about how did I do? I was talking to somebody about my sermons and I said, well, yeah, after I preach, I kind of have to preach it out. 
uh, I have to run it out. And so what I do is I like go on a run and preach the sermon again to myself. And they were like, man, I just drop it. I'm done. And then I go to bed. And I said, I wish I could do that. That would be wonderful. But I'm too worried about how did I do? Uh, but you know, like, when I'm done, if I am done, when I'm justified by faith, if I actually believed and rested and trusted in that, then I don't have to worry about what's happened. I don't have to worry about what's coming. I can actually be present. So you want mindfulness? Accept that God has counted you righteous in Jesus Christ based on nothing but faith alone. That's what allows you to be present and to enjoy other people and to not worry about what they think about you, what you've done, or what you're going to do. Justification by faith brings peace. Third, justification by faith gives you assurance and hope. Verse 9 says, Since we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Notice that justification by faith doesn't just give you present assurance, but it gives you assurance for the future. Look at the tenses. Saved by him from the wrath of God. Shall we be saved? Uh, we love reality-based TV. And we especially love competition reality-based TV. I mean, whether it's the Great British Baking Show or uh, Survivor or um, uh, that show our president was on or uh, whether it's um, yeah, uh, so you think you can dance or whatever. And the most brilliant thing in all these shows is this thing called immunity, right? Immunity is when there's a panel of judges and they're judging and if someone gets immunity, then that means that when they judge and they're talking about eliminating someone, uh, you get to keep going, right? If you have immunity, and it's, it's typical, it always happens, so somebody is kind of, they're under threat of being eliminated, there are kind of three people up there, and the judges will turn and they'll look at one of the people and they'll say, look, you're safe, you have immunity, but next week, you better turn this thing around, right? And there's always this sigh of relief, ah, oh, I have immunity, for a moment, and that sigh of relief lasts about as long as the episode lasts. And then the next week, they've got to go back to justifying their existence on the show. Justification by faith does not give us assurance for the present like immunity. It doesn't give us a sigh of relief. It gives us eternal security. It's not just for the present, but it is for the future. Look at verse 2. Because we have obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, we can rejoice in hope. We can rejoice in the hope of glory. Because that has been won for us and it is coming. See, it's not just that God declares you righteous now, but we'll see what happens in the future. It's God declares you righteous now and always. But there's this interesting thing, because all, all scholars basically understand that justification, by, that justification in the Bible, and in Paul particularly, is actually this kind of ultimate, final uh, judgment day act. It, it's God's judgment that comes on judgment day, like with the white throne and everything else, right? And, and so it's this future, ultimate judgment day act. And so you... That raises a question. If justification is a future, ultimate judgment day act, then how in the world can Paul say that we rejoice in the hope of glory now? If it hasn't happened yet. If, if, judgment is this, if justification is this future judgment day verdict, then how can, how can Paul say that and know for certain that we will be saved or we shall be saved from the wrath of God, verse 9. How can he do that? Well, simply because of this. For the Christian, that ultimate, final judgment day act, guess what? You've already been through it. 
See, that ultimate final judgment day act, that was brought forward into the present. It already happened for you. Christian, you have already faced judgment day and passed through the other side. Do you realize that? You have already been at the white throne of judgment. So, so that one day, someday, when you were there, and you look around, and you see like this throne, and all these people, and all this stuff going on, you're going to sit there, and you're going to say, this looks vaguely familiar. It feels like deja vu. Yes, because it is. And you're going to hear these words over you, I baptize you. I forgive you. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. That is the judgment day, and you have already experienced it. And when it comes visibly, that's just going to be deja vu. Now, there's no more certainty that you can have that you will pass through the judgment than that you have already passed through the judgment. <laughs> it's already happened. <sighs> And that gives you assurance and hope. But it also, fourthly, produces, it gives you this counterintuitive joy. Paul says something rather jarring in verse 3. He says that we rejoice in our sufferings. Now that sounds kind of sadistic. But why does he say we rejoice in our sufferings? Well, I don't think it's because Paul thinks that sufferings are so good or that He's not calling evil good or something like that. No, he's saying that we rejoice in our sufferings because, because Paul realizes that we know certain things. For instance, we know that God is for us. Verse 1, that since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if God is for us, who can be against us? We know that God is for us. So whatever our sufferings may mean, they don't mean that God is against us. And we know that God loves us, verse 5. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. So we know that whatever affliction and suffering that we, must, that we are experiencing, and whatever it may mean for us, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. That, that our suffering doesn't mean that God lo doesn't love us, and that his suffering on our behalf means that he loves us more than we could ever imagine. So whatever our sufferings may mean, as mysterious as they are, we know that it, it can't be because God is against us. And it can't be, it can't be that it's because he doesn't love us. And we also know that the sovereign God will use these sufferings in our lives. Look at verses 3 through 5. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. See, our sufferings, our affliction, whatever they may be, we know this, that, that they don't mean that God doesn't love us, that the Son of God loved us and gave himself for us. He has bought me with his precious blood and fully paid for all my sins. And therefore, all things must work together for my salvation. And suffering often, and affliction often, as Martin Luther said, it's often the place that God loves us because it's the place he loves us by helping us see that we're not in control. Because we want to control life. We want to control our circumstances. We want to control God. And that's, that's really what justification by us is all about. It's us trying to control our future and control our destiny and control the world. And in our afflictions and our sufferings, God says, no, you have to lean on me. I will be your God. I am the God who rescued you, who brought you out of the land of slavery. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me, even the God of making yourself your own savior and the controller of your destiny. You know, we often have this tally it's the tally that runs around in our head. You know the tally I'm talking about of all, all those bad things that we have done. All the ways in which we are, um, we don't measure up, in which we've fallen short. You know that tally. And any time things don't go our way, 
Anytime we experience suffering, hardship, loss, we start going through the tally. And as we start going through the tally, we think, this is it. God's getting his pound of flesh. This is payback for all the ways in which I have not been enough, loved him enough, done enough. Listen to me. You may count your sins against yourself, but God does not. He is not keeping a tally. He has removed the record of wrong. And he does not count your sin against you. So whatever your, fault, your suffering may mean, it is not because God is trying to get back at you, enact judgment from you, hurt you. That's not the case. And so we can have joy in the midst of suffering, peace in the midst of hardship, because we know that that God is for us and God loves us and, and all things must work together for our salvation. Fifth, justification by faith also gives you a counterintuitive self-image. Verse 6 says that Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8 says that God showed his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10 says that while we were his enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Ungodly, sinners, enemies. It, we by nature believe, we all believe in justification by works. That we are made right with God for us. We love that. We love self-improvement. We love the idea that we can improve ourselves. It takes grace to believe that God justifies the ungodly. But even then, most of us think that God also justifies the ungodly. God doesn't also justify the ungodly. God only justifies the ungodly. That's all there are. It, and it's not that God deals in parts. God doesn't deal in parts. God doesn't say, well, that action was 90% good, but 10% bad. No, it's all bad. It's all contaminated. And I had a really good illustration for this, but Pam said it was too crass, so I'm not going to use it. But it's all contaminated. You fill in the blank. Everything that we've done. So, it's not just the things that we have done, but more terrifyingly, the things we have left undone. It's not just our words and our deeds but more terrifyingly, our thoughts and our motives. It's not just those sins that we know about, but more terrifyingly, those sins that we don't know about. See, we are ungodly. Sinners. And here's what that means. It means that you can no longer feel superior to anyone else ever again. It means that I can no longer feel superior to anyone else ever again. In Romans 3.27, uh, Paul says that because, because it took nothing less than the Son of God dying for us to count us right before God, we have no right to boast over another person. That the pride that divides humanity... Jew from Gentile, white from black, American from Chinese. That the, that the pride that divides humanity is crucified on Calvary's mountain. And that every distinction that we would try to curry to leverage ourselves over against another person, well, those distinctions are buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. We have no right to boast. And that will humble you. It will make you humble. It will make you humble so that when, when people say, 
things about you, you can critique you, are able to like hear them. Uh, it will humble you. It will humble you from feeling like you always have to put other debts down and feel sustain, disdain towards them. But it will also give you compassion. Like true compassion. The compassion that's not patronizing is putting yourself and seeing yourself in the place of another. Justification by faith allows us to see ourselves in the place of another because we realize this, that we too are ungodly, sinners, enslaved and captive by the powers of sin. That we all fall short of God's glory against the relief of the cross. And that en enables you to move into other people's lives with compassion because you realize that the will is not free. Free will is something that people who like to think that they are competent believe. But when you start to realize that the will is not free, it actually gives you compassion towards yourself and towards others. In a book called Mistakes Were Made, but not by me, <laughs> social psychologist Carol Tavris and Elliot Aronson study couples and they note how the enactment and focus upon standards, how is the other person doing in the relationship, choke out love. They write, the vast majority of couples who drift apart do so slowly over time and in, sno in, a, in a snowballing pattern of blame and self-justification. Each part of, partner focuses on what the other is doing wrong while justifying his or her, her own preferences, attitudes, and ways of doing things. From our standpoint, they write, therefore, Misunderstandings, conflicts, personality differences, and even angry quarrels are not the assassins of love. Self-justification is. And I see it all the time. I mean, the amount of couples that come into my office for marriage counseling whose marriage is in trouble, you, can, you better believe that somewhere along the way they started, in, they started relating to one another on the basis of standards. You keep my standard, and if you don't, and there's no grace and no compassion and there's self-justification, you don't meet up, but where I fail, I have reasons for that and reasons for my action. But you see, the cross actually enables us to enter in, to have compassion toward the other, and especially our spouse and our family members. Because the cross, it wounds us, but it also heals us. It kills us, but it also makes us alive. You see, the cross is not about reformation. It is about transformation. We love reformation. We love self-improvement. That's not what the gospel gives us. The gospel doesn't give us a better life. It gives us a new life. It kills and it makes alive. And it means that we don't ever have to, we can no longer feel superior to anyone else ever again. But it also means that you don't ever have to feel inferior to anyone else ever again because you have the righteousness of Jesus and you have been through the judgment and God has deemed your life acceptable. And you don't ever have to let another person look down on you ever again. And that means that when someone judges or attacks you, you are able to take that uh, and it gives you this ability, on the one hand, to receive their critique. It could be right. And also to receive their critique because you say, and whether you're right or wrong, my life and my existence is not at stake in this. See, you can be, you can be in the right without having to be right. That's what justification by faith means. And that enables you and gives you resources to move into conflict, which we all have to move into. It gives you the courage to do so because you realize that my existence is not at stake. But it also gives you the humility to do so because you realize I could be wrong. But you also could be right. And it gives you a healthy disassociation because what you're after is the truth and love and not about defending yourself. Because it frees you from having to do that. 
That's justification by faith. In other words, what it does, and this is my last point, is it sets you free. It sets you free. There was this really bad 90s song by a band called Soup Dragons. And in that song, they sang this line, I'm free to do what I want any old time. We love freedom, and that's usually our view of it. The freedom to determine your own existence. The freedom to determine yourself. And we said we have to be free. But look, always having to define and defend yourself, to reinvent and reconstruct yourself over and over again, based on the fashion trends or rejecting the fashion trends or based on your work or based on uh, your, your group or self-identity or whatever it is, or sexuality, our, our incessant need to construct our own identities through social media and whatever, it is exhausting. Like, it exhausts people. We are an exhausted people, worn out and anxious from always having to do this. That's not freedom, that's slavery. Having to define yourself and determine your own existence is not freedom, it is slavery. And we are enslaved, but the gospel of justification by faith, it, it actually sets you free. It sets you free from sin's penalty, which we've dealt with, but it also sets you free from its power. Romans 6, 7 says, the one who has died has been set free from sin. And that word set free is the same word that Paul uses throughout justify. See, justification is a verdict that delivers you. It delivers you from prison. It delivers you from the courtroom. It delivers you and sets you free to walk outside and eat a hot dog. And do what you want. It sets you free. That's why in, when Paul's preaching in Acts 13, 39, he says, By him, that is by Jesus, everyone who believes is free from everything from which you could not be free from under the law of Moses. Everything. It sets you free. Free from worry about your standing with God. Free from worrying about your future. Free from self-obsession. Free from self-promotion. Free from self-protection. Free from self-defense. It sets you free to come clean and admit wrong. You know, ever since the garden in Genesis 3, we have felt that we are naked. And what that means is we feel shame and we hide. And when we hide, that just compounds the problem in cycles of shame and self-destruction, and self-abuse. But, but this justification of my faith, it allows you to come clean because the righteousness of Jesus is a safe place to come clean in. It's a place of full acceptance. And this enables you to be free to seek help. Help before things are public because you can come clean. It also, most importantly, it allows you to be free to love and to serve others without having to think how they could add to your resume or get you further in life. Because you don't have to worry about your resume anymore. And it allows you freedom to enjoy God's presence, which is the most beautiful thing of all. So are you free? Are you free? Free to know that you are not your own. That you have been bought with a price. That you are loved. That you are his. And that the command and promise of the first commandment. Free to have the Lord as your Lord and your God and him alone. Are you free? Believe. Believe that you are not enough, that you cannot be enough, that you cannot do enough, that you cannot have enough. Believe that Jesus is enough. And you will live in freedom and be free indeed. Amen.